You're driving on a two-lane road. Suddenly, an oncoming car pulls out to pass. You're dangerously close to a head-on collision. Hi, I'm Christopher Reeve, and welcome to the National Driving Test. Would you know what to do in that situation? Unfortunately, many people don't. They're sending their cars to graveyards like this and themselves to another kind altogether. Well, let's start the program with a question. What part of the car causes the most accidents? The answer, of course, is the driver. 85% of all traffic accidents are caused by mistakes made by drivers. And since about 164 million of you drive, we're going to help you learn some things that could save your life or someone else's. It's a test of your driving knowledge. 25 questions totaling 100 points. This test has been developed in association with the National Safety Council, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, and the Automobile Association of America, as well as other safe driving organizations. Look at it as a wake-up call designed to help you wake up to the fact that there's something you can do to be a better driver and help reduce the staggering number of traffic accidents in this country. Over 2 million disabling injuries and close to 50,000 deaths a year. Part one of the test is called the good defense. Well, it's time for the first question on the test. It's worth four points. You're driving on a two-lane road. Passing is allowed in either direction. An oncoming car pulls out to pass and he's coming head-on in your lane. What should you do? A. Turn quickly into the left lane. B. Slow down and move to the right. C. Stay in your lane and maintain your speed. D. Stop immediately in your lane. Once again, the oncoming car is heading right for you. What should you do? The correct answer is B. Slow down and move to the right. Slowing down will help you maintain control. Moving to the right gets you out of the way. Do these at the same time and be prepared to keep moving to the right, even if you have to drive off the road completely to avoid a collision. Okay, next question, number two. You're driving a car, approaching a blind intersection where there are no stop signs or signals. Suddenly a car appears from the cross street. You strike it broadside. How could you have avoided this? A. Turn sharply to the left. B sounded your horn as you approached the intersection. C, braked and then kept your foot over the brake pedal as you approached the intersection. Or D, there was nothing you could have done about it. The correct answer is C, braked and then kept your foot over the brake pedal as you approached the intersection. If you're coming up to an uncontrolled intersection, that is one with no stop signs, traffic signals, or police controlling traffic, you need to be especially careful. Slow down by braking slightly and then keep your foot just above the brake pedal. This covering your brake allows you to react much faster. For example, if you're traveling at 30 miles an hour, you can stop 20 to 25 feet earlier than if you still had your foot on the gas. And that movement could mean the difference between life and death. So if you answered correctly, and you see, you give yourself another four points. Here's something to think about. Out of every hundred people, 86 of us stand a chance of being in an accident that causes injury sometime during our driving careers. With that in mind, here's our next question. Number three, worth four points. You're driving down a two-lane road, the car in front of you stops suddenly, and you slam into its rear end. How could you have avoided this collision? A, look further down the road. B, left more distance between your car and the car in front of you. C, step down your brake harder. D. Watch the brake lights of the car ahead. Once again, the car in front of you stopped suddenly. How could you have avoided slamming into it? The correct answer is B. Left more distance between your car and the car in front of you. You should always be looking 12 to 15 seconds ahead, about the equivalent of a city block. Well, give yourself another four points if you answered B. And here's a good rule of thumb to make sure you're following at a safe distance. Use what's called the two-second rule. Watch the vehicle in front of you pass a fixed object or point like this telephone pole. Then count to yourself 1,001, 1,002. If your car reaches that same fixed point before you finish counting, you're too close. Now let's move on to question four. We've all been here before. It's night, the guy coming toward you is blinding you with his high beams. You've already tried to signal by using your headlights. The other guy doesn't respond. What you should do now is turn on your high beams to counteract the glare to help you see the roadway. Is that true or false? Well, the answer is false. You should not turn on your high beams while you encounter another car. 
In fact, in most states, it's actually illegal to have your high beams on within 500 feet of an oncoming vehicle. While it's common practice to briefly flash your lights to warn another driver, it's very dangerous to leave your high beams on because it can blind the driver at the oncoming vehicle, actually doubling the danger. So if you answered false, you add another four points to your score. Okay, now it's time for the last question, number five, in the good defense portion of the driving test. It's another true or false question, and it's worth four points. You're driving on a multi-lane highway, and the car that is overtaking you appears to be out of control, weaving from side to side. The best course of action is to stay in your lane and maintain your speed. True or false? The answer is false. The correct response is, if safe, get into another lane, or even pull off the road and stop. You want to get as far away as you can get from the weaving driver. Okay, well, you got all five questions right in the good defense section. You're cruising along with 20 points. Coming up next, rules of the road. Let's take a drive. It's a nice day. Maybe you're dropping off the children or taking a quick trip to the market, going to work. Nothing particularly out of the ordinary. Just a normal drive down the street in any town USA. Well, now it's time to test your memory. Question number six. You've just been on the driver's seat on a typical drive. What was the last road sign you saw? Give up? Well, let's take the same drive again and see what we missed. The last road sign was the symbol for school crossing. If you missed that question, you weren't alone. 80% of all the drivers could not tell us the road sign. Question number seven, worth a half a point each. Identify and define these eight signs or signals. Watch carefully now. Here we go. Sign number one. Here's sign number two. Sign number three. Now sign number four. Sign number five. Here's sign six. Sign number seven. And the final sign, number eight. Got them all? Let's go back and see how we did. Remember, you had to do more than just name the sign. You had to know what it means, too. Sign number one, slippery when wet. That's self-explanatory. Sign number two, red light, green arrow. This means that all traffic going in the direction of the arrow may proceed. All other traffic has to stop. Sign number three, no U-turn. We called them UEs when I was growing up. No U-turn means no 180 degree turns. Sign number four, road narrows. This means that the road might become significantly narrower ahead. Sign number five, merge. This means you have to blend in with the existing traffic. Sign number six, flashing red light. Probably the most missed symbol of all means come to a complete stop. Then, when safe, proceed. Think of it as a stop sign. Sign number seven, wrong way. It means wrong way. Don't enter. Traffic will be coming against you. Sign number eight, workers ahead. This is very important. It indicates construction workers will soon be in or alongside the upcoming stretch of road. Okay, time for question number eight of the driving test. The lane on my left is marked on each side by a solid and broken yellow line. What's this lane for? A, passing other cars. B, left turns. C, driving around to avoid congestion. D, momentary stopping. The correct answer is B. A lane marked on each side by a solid and broken yellow line is used for beginning or ending left turns. Don't use it for anything other than preparing to make or complete the turn. In some states, U-turns are allowed from this lane. Check with your state to be sure. Requested it's worth four points. Hi, I'm Sarah Gilbert from Roseanne. For those of you who've watched the show, you know how hard my parents were. So they don't have a lot of time to drive me to school, which is why I spend a lot of time on the school bus. They always tell me to be careful getting on or off. Well, we want you to be careful too. That's what this next question, number nine, is all about. You're on the street approaching a school bus with its red lights flashing. What do you do? A, come to a complete stop, then continue carefully. B, come to a stop and wait to move until the lights are no longer flashing and the bus is moving. C, slow down and pass the bus carefully. Or D, come to a complete stop only if you see kids around. 
The correct answer is D. Flashing red lights on a school bus means come to a stop and wait to move until the lights are no longer flashing and the bus is actually moving. There may be kids you can't see getting on or off the bus. Remember, in most states, you don't have to stop if you're driving on the opposite side of a divided roadway. But no matter where you are, be careful. If you got that one right, answer B, you give yourself another four points. Now, question number 10 has four parts. They're worth one point each. These questions concern right of way, or who should yield in certain situations. The law never actually gives anyone the right of way, but it does indicate who should yield or give way when vehicles encounter one another. Here's the first situation. There's a four-way stop intersection and cars A and B arrive at the same time. Who should yield? The answer, car A should yield to car B. Whoever arrives at the intersection first has the right of way. But when cars arrive at the same time, the car on the left should yield to the car on the right. In the next situation, two cars are facing each other, both turning onto the same street. Who should yield the right of way? The answer is car A should yield. A car making a left turn should yield to all oncoming traffic. Example C, a car approaches an unregulated intersection where a pedestrian starts to cross. There's no marked crosswalk. Who should yield? The car should yield to the pedestrian at any intersection, even if there is no marked crosswalk. And the last example, a car is about to make a right-hand turn from the driveway as car B approaches in that same lane. Who should yield? The answer is car A should yield. Cars entering a roadway should always yield to those already on the road. We've had 10 questions worth 40 points. Next, we'll have questions on the driving environment. Sometimes, there's just nothing you can do about what's on the road. You're driving along the street, everything's fine, then you turn a corner and bang, you're blinded by the glare of the sun. Here's question 11. Name three things you should do as a driver to minimize sun glare. The three things you should do as a driver to reduce sun glare are, number one, make sure your windshield is clean inside and out. Number two, adjust the sun visor. Just make sure you don't block your view of the road when you do it. Number three, wear sunglasses. Polarizing gray lenses block glare most effectively. Let's try that drive again, and you'll see what you should have seen the first time. If you got all three answers, give yourself four points. Only two correct answers, two points, one answer, one point. Now from the sun to the rain, question number 12. When do you think the road is slickest during a rainfall? A, anytime it's raining. B, the first minutes of rain. C, 30 minutes after the rain stops. Or D, towards the end of the storm. Give yourself four points for the correct answer, B. The road is slickest during the first minutes of rain. Then oil on the road, which is lighter than water, floats up to the surface of the pavement. This creates a thin film of oil and a very slick driving surface. Depending on the strength of the rainfall, most of the oil is eventually washed away. You know the saying that oil and water don't mix? Well, they do create a perfect environment for a skid. Well, let's say your car does go into a skid. Here to tell us what to do is someone who knows how to handle a car, even in the worst situation. His training and skills have actually saved his life. Side by side, going into turn three. Ammo down low in the middle of the track, and Ammo may have it. They almost touch oh, the they touch. wheels. And into the wall is Al Jr. Ammo continues on. They touch wheels in turn three. Ammo continues on. You can see the damage to the number two, Al Unser Jr. Most of you will never find yourself in that situation, but you may find yourself in a skid. Whether you're doing 200 miles an hour at Indianapolis or 25 on your neighborhood street, there's nothing worse than your car suddenly shooting off in a direction you had no intention of going. Let's see if you know what to do. Question number 13 of the National Driving Test is a multiple choice question. If your car goes into a skid, you should A, take your foot off the accelerator, B, keep your foot off the brake, C, steer the vehicle in the direction of the skid, D, all of the above. The correct answer is D, all of the above. Let me demonstrate. The instant you lose control, take your foot off of the accelerator, 
turn in the direction of the skid, keep your foot off the brakes so that they won't lock up. Once you regain control, accelerate gently, bring the car back into a completely normal situation. Sometimes you think you're doing absolutely nothing wrong on the road, but you could be breaking the law. For instance, question 14. Under what conditions can you get a ticket for actually driving the posted speed limit? A, during bad weather conditions, B, in heavy traffic, C, in a residential zone where children are playing in the street, or D, all of the above? The answer is D, all of the above. Because of what's known as the basic speed law, all of the conditions listed above, plus many others, are regulated by this law. It says that if conditions make it unsafe to drive the posted speed limit, you can't drive it. Use common sense and give yourself four points if you got the correct answer, D. Time now for the last question in the driving environment portion of the test. Number 15, it's a true or false question. When driving in fog, you should always use your high beams. Is that true or false? Add four points if you answered false. You should always use your low beams in fog. Most people missed this question. You'd naturally think that the more light you have, the better you can see. But the moisture in the fog reflects the light right back to you. Well, we're over halfway through the test. And at this point, if you've answered everything correctly, you should have a total of 60 points for the first 15 questions. Coming up next, we're going to look at some of the unexpected things that might happen when you're out on the road and what you can do about it. The next three questions will test your skills in some tense situations. Hi, I'm Lorenzo Lamas. As a professional race driver, I know it's often the everyday driving that gets you into some real nail-biting situations. This section is designed to help show you what to expect when you face the unexpected. This is question number 16, and it's worth four points. You're driving on a downhill slope approaching a stop sign. When you step on the brakes, they fail. What's the first thing you should do? A, shift your car into a lower gear. B, apply the emergency brake. C, pump your brake pedal and try to build pressure. D, if possible, steer off the road to the right to a clear area. What is the first thing you should do? The correct answer is C. If your brakes fail, pump your brake pedal to try to build up pressure. That is the first course of action you should try because there still may be enough pressure. If that doesn't work, then shift into a lower gear so the engine will help you stop. The parking brake is for the final part of the stop, so apply it slowly so the brakes won't lock. Now here's question number 17. You're driving 45 miles an hour on a roadway and suddenly your right wheels drop off the edge of the pavement. What should you do? A. Slow gradually before turning back onto the pavement. B. Turn back onto the pavement at once. C. Drive onto the shoulder and stop. D. Steer straight ahead and speed up to gain maximum control of your vehicle. The correct answer is A. Slow gradually before turning back onto the pavement. Keep a firm grip on the steering wheel. When it's safe and your speed is under control, turn the wheel quickly about a quarter turn to the left. Give yourself four points if you answered correctly. Question number 18 is the last question in the tales of the unexpected, and it's a real white knuckle. While driving down the street, you take your foot off the accelerator to brake and find your accelerator is stuck. After tapping the gas pedal and trying to free it, now pay attention, here's a twist. Which of the following should you never do? A, turn off your ignition. B, immediately put your car in neutral and brake. C, reach down and try to pull the gas pedal up with your hand. D, none of the above. The correct answer is C, never try to pull the gas pedal up with your hand. This is a very dangerous action because no matter how quickly you think it can be done, your vision of the roadway is blocked. If tapping the accelerator with your foot doesn't work, shift your car into neutral and apply the brakes. Drive off the road if possible or as far to the right side as you can. Take care if you turn off your ignition that you don't turn the key so far that it locks the steering wheel. Give yourself another four points if you chose the correct answer, C. Well, after 18 questions, the total number of points you could have scored or should have scored is... 72. With 
self-service gas station is popping up on almost every street corner, we're forced to do a lot of the routine maintenance on our cars ourselves. That's why the next section of the driving test goes under the hood. Hi, I'm Susan Rotan of L.A. Law, and I have a confession to make. I'm a bit of a grease monkey. I like to work on cars. And here's question number 19. It has to do with car fluids. Uh, for one point each, name four fluids that should be checked regularly and replaced when necessary. By the way, there are seven, so you've got extra chances to pick four. Here are the seven fluids that should be checked and replaced when necessary. One, oil. Two, automatic transmission fluid. Three, brake fluid. Four, radiator coolant and or water. Five, battery water. Six, windshield washer fluid. Seven, steering fluid. Now remember to give yourself a point each, up to four points if you name four out of the seven fluids. Now for extra credit, see if you can identify what these fluids are. Now, some manufacturers may vary, but these are the most common. Now, here's some red stuff. If you see that on the ground or on your shirt, check your automatic transmission fluid. Green stuff, well, that's coolant. Uh, brown, that's oil, dirty oil. This is clean oil over here. Now, this sort of reddish-brown gunk, that's steering fluid. And this, that's last night's spaghetti dinner. Hi, I'm Perry King. When I'm not acting, you can often find me on a racetrack, but today I'm on a closed portion of the L.A. freeway to demonstrate the next question in the Valvoline National Driving Test. And here's question number 20. Having underinflated tires on a dry road gives you A, better control of steering and braking, B, more traction, C, less control of steering and braking, or D, better gas mileage. Now, what do you think? The correct answer is C. Having underinflated tires gives you less control of your steering and braking. Next is one of the most important life-saving sections of the test. But first, a fact. There's 34 states and the District of Columbia that have mandatory safety belt laws, which means before you even put the key in the ignition, you have to buckle up. Question 21 is all about safety belts. There's four parts worth a point each. Here's the first. Wearing safety belts give you a greater chance of escaping a burning or submerged vehicle. True or false? For one point, the answer is true. A safety belt will increase your chances of being conscious and in position to either get out of the car or control it. If you don't think safety belts are important, watch this. Whoa! I hope he's okay. Yeah, he's... If the driver of this car hadn't worn a safety belt, it would have been impossible for him to have escaped injury or to have removed himself from the burning car. Continuing with part two of question 21, safety belts reduce injuries only in collisions above 15 miles an hour. Is that true or false? For one point, the answer is false. A driver's head can strike the windshield, the steering wheel, or the dashboard at a speed as low as five miles an hour. And now for part three of question 21. Safety belts are more effective on the highway than for local street driving. Is that true or false? At one point, the answer is false. 80% of accidents occur at speeds of 40 miles an hour or less. Here's the next generation of drivers. And to make sure he gets his turn, pay attention to part four of question 21. Here's Meredith Baxter Burney. Okay, our next question concerns safety belts and children. This is Alexander. He's going to help us. The safest place for your baby is in an infant seat, in the back seat, facing backwards. True or false? The answer, true. Give yourself one point. Most people think that the baby should be facing forward so you can see what's going on. Well, that's not the case. Place your baby's safety seat in the back seat, facing backwards, and make sure it's properly anchored to the seat with the safety belt. That's for infants. Larger babies or toddlers weighing up to 40 pounds can be buckled into forward-facing toddler seats, like this one. This seat must be secured with a safety belt, too. When a child reaches the point when his head clears the back seat, then you can use the regular safety belt. Just make sure that the shoulder strap doesn't cut into his neck. And make sure that your child and you know how to use safety belts properly. The lap belt should be tied across the hips, never across the stomach. And the shoulder strap should be comfortable, but snug. 
never so loose that it would just fall off your shoulder. And remember, for many of the new cars that have the automatic safety belts, you still have to buckle the lap belt to be fully protected. Here's another true false question for you, worth four points. Question number 22. I've got all the mirrors on the car adjusted properly. This means I've eliminated all the blind spots. Is that true or false? Well, the answer is false, because even with the mirrors properly adjusted, there still are blind spots. Take a look. The rear view mirror allows you to see directly behind you. The side mirrors help you see immediately to either side of the car, but for a limited distance only. Take a look at what I see in the side view mirror. Nothing, right? Now take a look at what was in the blind spot. Now seriously, the shaded areas on this diagram show you what you can't see in your car. Here's an important tip for you when passing or overtaking another car. If you can't see that car's rear view mirror, that means they can't see you either, and you're in their blind spot. To make sure you haven't missed a vehicle behind you, turn your head for a last second check before changing lanes. The total points to date, if you've gotten everything right, is 88. Of the nearly 50,000 people who die each year in traffic accidents, over half die because of alcohol-related incidents. To see how much we know about the effects of alcohol, we've asked for a little help from one of the top celebrity drivers in the country and also a great athlete. Here's question number 23. It's a two-part question, each part worth two points, and they're both going to be true-false. The average mixed drink has a stronger effect on you than a glass of wine or a mug of beer. The answer? is false. 1.5 ounce glass of whiskey, a 5 ounce glass of wine, or 12 ounces of beer all have the same effect on you. They all contain the same amount of alcohol. So if you answered false, give yourself two points. Part two of question number 23. Drinking black coffee, getting some strenuous exercise, or taking a cold shower reduces the effects of alcohol. True or false? The answer? False. The only way to reduce the effects of alcohol is to stop drinking and wait. Two points for a false answer. The next question, 24, also deals with your own physical capacity. True or false? Over-the-counter medication can affect your driving ability. The answer is true. Many over-the-counter medications can affect your driving ability and reaction time. That means cold medicines, allergy pills, cough medicines, and lots more. And combining them with alcohol can multiply the effects. So learn to pay close attention to labels. This is what you should look for. This particular box says, do not drive or operate machinery while taking this medicine as it may cause drowsiness. A correct answer, true, on that question gives you another four points. And now it's time for the last question in the test. Question 25, another four points. As we get older, which ability is usually the first to deteriorate? A, reaction time. B, sense of direction. C, hearing. Or D, night vision. The answer is D, night vision. It's the ability that deteriorates first and fastest, and a noticeable difference after about age 40. Now, let's try this. We're going to show you a scene at night for a short period of time. Tell me how many signs, this type of sign, you can see. How many did you see? The answer is four. Look again. Here's the scene, and here are the signs. If you didn't see four signs, well, that's a sign you shouldn't be driving at night. Okay, let's see how you scored. If you got all the questions right, 100%, congratulations. You look great on paper. But remember that last year alone, one in every five drivers had some kind of a wreck. Watch out for them. If you scored 90 to 99 points, you're better than average. But it takes better than average skills to survive on today's highways. If you scored 82 to 89, that might get you a B in school, but it ranks only average in this test. And the average driver makes two and a half mistakes for each mile he drives. 76 to 81, you're a little below average. Anything below 76, you have a below average score. You should really think about your driving. You might want to take a defensive driving course. This test by no means has a definitive say on what kind of a driver you are, but it is a good guide to what you need to know. And we hope we've shown you some things you can do to make yourself a better driver and some things to watch out for with the other guy. We'd like to thank the following for their cooperation in designing this test.